Hello everyone and thanks for joining us today on our Data Center Roundtable. With so many new technologies, new requirements and AI development going on, today we'll be discussing the best practices in data center management to help you prepare for the future. And lastly, we will get a sneak peek on the role of AI for data center, because we can't have a tech discussion these days without talking about AI, can we? And as you follow along, we encourage you to leave your own questions in the comment section, and we promise you that Scott will answer all of them. Before we dive into the discussion, let's give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves. Scott, let's start with you, since you're going to be answering all of the questions. Sure. So my name is Scott Snedden. Um, I'm a data center specialist here at Juniper, focusing on mostly our enterprise market, but um, just about anywhere where we work with customers on data center. Yeah, and I'm Claire Delcourt. I'm from Belgium, and I've been living in the States for seven years. I'm a product manager for network automation for that much time, too. Uh, and I'm product manager for Abstra. I'm Samir Parikh. I'm uh, the vice president of product management for Juniper's data center business, focusing on Abstra and automation and a lot of our software solutions that sort of provide the operational foundation for our data center offering. Great. It's an honor to have you guys here. So with new trends, new technologies comes with new challenges as well. So maybe you could share you know, some of the challenges that you have observed in the last year and maybe even some interesting customer stories. So maybe I can talk about what I'm uh, commonly hearing from customers is how the data center network has not become more simple. Uh, on the contrary, the network has become more complex because we're bringing in new technology in the network to accommodate things like um, virtual workloads, containers, VMs, and so forth. We want more security. Uh, we want more mobility for the workloads. So you need to bring, in order to accommodate those uh, new demands, uh, you need to bring new technology in the data center network, and it makes it a bit more complex. Uh, you know, thinking about technology like EVP and VXLAN, new security layers. So you lose a lot of, you add complexity, you lose observability in your network, and uh, it becomes harder and harder. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, I'm seeing exactly that with one customer I'm working with currently. Um, this is an advanced customer. They're a smart team. They know how technology works. They've got some older data center architectures and made the wise decision to move forward to a data center fabric using EVP and VXLAN. You know, all of the recommended architectures that we talked about, but they tried to do it manually. Mm -hmm. They are the kind of guys that they're really smart, so they want to figure it out for themselves. And they read the guides, and, and they developed their own configurations, and then moved forward. And it didn't go perfectly, and they introduced some errors during their maintenance window that were fairly difficult to recover from. Um, they missed a few key things that you know, were in the manuals, but maybe not totally obvious to find, right? So, yeah, we talk about moving technology forward, and these architectures that we've introduced are a lot simpler compared to when I was operating data centers, but they're still not completely simple. The skills don't always align to where we are with technology today. So um, yeah, the challenges are, are even though people have agreed to move forward on architectures, the skills don't always match. And even in the smartest environments, mistakes can still happen. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point on skills, Scott. I mean, the thing that we're seeing is, you know, engineers coming out of college today, they're not being trained on classic networking technologies, right? They're, they're learning the ways of the cloud, right? Because that's the dominant pattern. That's where, you know, that's the exciting pattern. And so as you see the networking industry getting older, you have this big skills gap. And so uh, that's why tooling and what we can do on automation to sort of bridge that gap is super important because, you know, otherwise we're gonna run into this perennial problem of how do we sort of train up people to handle these technology transitions because the transition itself from an old architecture to new architecture, however simpler it might be, uh, presents complexity in itself. For sure. Mm -hmm. So you, you did touch on, you know, some recommendations, you did mention some recommendations on how to manage the data center more efficiently, but, you know, maybe you can spend more, you know, con considering all these complexities that uh, our customers are doing these days, our audience are dealing these days. Give us some advice on how to manage it more efficiently, both on operational and economical standpoint? I think that's, that's a great question. I'll touch on this of the economics of it, um, right? I think, you know, it's top of mind for all of our customers. We look at the macro environment and, you know, the key element is sort of the economics of those data center is using standard space, interoperable and open technology. So, you know, what we see with our customers is, 
this move towards EVP and VXLAN fabrics because it's an industry standard. Like it, it operates across multiple vendors. There's test results. All the vendors participate in these testing forums to demonstrate and prove interoperability. So that's a key foundation for sort of how you deal with complexity, at least on the economic standpoint. And you know, on the operation side, I mean, automation is key, but you know, automation is its own can of worms, which I'm sure, Scott, yeah. you've lived through. You see a lot of customers, that customer I mentioned before is a really good example of, of you know, they know networks and they know network engineering and, and they um, expect that, that they'll be able to write their own automation really efficiently. And, and yeah, they have cost, cost constraints. And so they didn't want to pay for a tool from a vendor to build this automation because they know they can write that code themselves. And in the end, maybe it might have been a bit more expensive for them to automate their way into a problem and then yeah. have to recover from that. So yeah, really considering the long-term economic impact of your decisions is needed and, and, and taking those considerations very, very seriously is important. In, in fact, talking about DIY, we have a report showing that people doing DIY end up you know, costing more than just acquiring a third-party right. automation and, tool. And there are places that yeah. have done it very successfully. Yeah. We see this with, with the cloud scale companies, right? They they can hire the best engineers mm -hmm. and write code all day long and do that. You know, they've figured out their economic model that works for them, but that model doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Yeah. I think another advice I could probably give uh, in terms of, you know, building this dream solution with software uh, is take your time to evaluate the software that are out there. I think it can be very overwhelming for customers that don't have uh, a foot in automation yet to understand where to go. Do I do it myself? Mm -hmm. Do I go with a vendor? Do I trust the vendor that they're going to give me the best software for the bug? Uh, so take your time to evaluate software solution. Uh, find something that's going to work well with the skill sets you have, because every team, every enterprise has a different type of skill set in the team. Um, and uh, make sure you, 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 you go with a solution that is going to get you where you want to be longer term for your automation goal, uh, dream big, you know, dream reliability, yeah. dream automation. You know, dream multi-cloud, don't be afraid to dream big and go with um, uh, software and then you can justify that investment to your management much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the skills thing, I think that a, a great example that we see from customers where they succeeded, you look at the hyperscalers, is they've done a very good job of pairing network engineers and software engineers, right? Because ultimately, when we think about, people think network automation, it's not, the hard part is not necessarily the networking piece, it's the software and systems component of building an automation system. And this is where why we encourage people to look at vendor solutions because you're getting somebody with software expertise that builds that for you. But if you're gonna approach it and sort of your own uh, on your own and build it from other components, really look at how you pair network engineers and software engineers together to sort of solve that problem mm -hmm. because that context is important. Talking about doing things easier and more efficiently, um, I've read in a report by Enterprise Strategy Group saying that 75% of enterprises will keep most of their apps in the private cloud. So cloud has been popular for many years, but you know, how come people seem to repatriate to on-prem? Why is that? And you know, what is your advice to our audience when it comes to deciding whether they should go on-prem, uh, public, or hybrid? Yeah. It comes back to economics. I, I think that's what we're seeing. You know, the promise of cloud was that everything would be easy, and it largely is. I mean, the promise of cloud is that everything would be fast and you can turn things on right away and do everything you need on demand, and it is. I mean, those, those promises all came true. The problem is that the cost can be unpredictable, and it's really difficult for a business line to justify such a variable cost when their revenue isn't the same mm -hmm. variability. And, and so the economics are really dictating that people work towards models that are more financially predictable, financially manageable. And so I, I think the, the now and the future is, is decidedly hybrid. I, I think the decision is not cloud first, but cloud right. And, and it's all cloud. But which cloud? Is it that private environment that's inside the walls of your data center, or is it some blend of public and private? And, and I think I, I see more and more successful businesses considering application by application, including considerations of the skills that they have available to support those applications, and making wise decisions as to where workloads are going to run.
Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things on the, when you think about economics of the cloud, data becomes a key anchor there because, you know, the data transfer costs is like the most common complaint. You see users on Reddit and Twitter and like they complain about the data transfer costs. And, and so data gravity becomes a big decision point for what you put in the cloud versus what you keep in-house. And, and then you also see a lot, new, a lot of new regulations around data sovereignty and privacy. Mm -hmm. And that's another factor. So I think enterprises are now looking at saying, okay, cloud's not this panacea. It's a very important and valuable tool in our tool chain, but it's not like everything is fit for the cloud. We're gonna make a more thoughtful choice around what makes sense and what doesn't. And we, we cannot point out the problems without giving an answer, right? So what does Juniper has to offer to help people manage private data center well, more efficiently? I, I, I mean, I, I think I, I said it's all cloud. Uh -huh. But in reality, most private data centers are not that cloud-like. This is why developers still like mm -hmm. to go to the public cloud, is it is easy and it is fast, and they can do what they want to when they want it without mm -hmm. having to go through a bunch of process to get it done. And, and so I think the onus is on the private cloud operators, the data center operators and enterprise to present their environment like a cloud, yes. to make things on demand, to make things easily consumable, easily configurable. If you've got to wait 15 minutes for a cable ticket, let alone two weeks to mm -hmm. get something provisioned, well, that developer's just going to go to public cloud. And unless you take away their credit card, they're not going to stop doing that. That's right. And so you've got to consider ways to build private infrastructure. And that's where our focus is. Our, our, what we're doing around optimizing operations, leveraging AI to make operations simpler, really the end goal is to just make it easy to use a data center. Right, and that, you know, that's where it becomes super important for your network team to not be composed of just networking experts anymore and to bringing expertise from people that are software developer, that has developed automation solution, whatever they are, and bring those skills in your team and try to rebuild the cloud-like experience for your on-prem data center. And in terms of what we have to offer, I mean, I think a foundation for us is Abstra, right? Because it gives us it provides our customers with the ability to give their customers a cloud-like mm -hmm. experience, right? With the work we've done around intent-based automation, and you look at what we've done around infrastructure as code frameworks with Terraform, right? You're giving, uh, now with Appster, and, and our customers have the ability to give their customers a cloud-like API, right? You know, if you're, if you're an AWS user, more likely you're consuming that through Terraform and you're provisioning and destroying infrastructure that way. Well, we can give you that same interface on top of Appster. And like that becomes the foundation for how customers can now, uh, you know, have that seamless experience with this on-prem private cloud or public cloud uh, because you give them a common tool layer. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty amazing. And, you know, as we talk about intent base and make things easier for our customers, um, I'm, I'm sure we have plans in the AI side of the house, right? So, you know, how can we walk away today without mentioning AI? <laughs> so what, what are the plans in the Juniper Data Center group, uh, you know, in terms of integrations with AI? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. You're right, we can't, we can't end a session without talking about AI. I think when we think of AI, there's two amazing sort of ways AI is gonna change the network in the future, right? One is AI ops, mm -hmm. uh, and the other one is sort of how you build infrastructure optimized for AI workloads. So I'll talk a little bit about AI ops. I mean, obviously at Juniper, you know, we are the leading AI engine. We, we have the leading AI ops provider in the, in the world today with Marvis, which is, you know, today sort of the AI foundation for our enterprise business, for campus, branch, and wireless. Uh, and we are absolutely gonna infuse that Marvis engine into the data center. So you'll see very soon from us, you know, discussions around how Marvis, you know, and its AI ops engine combined with Appster and its intent engine sort of truly transform the way you build and operate data centers. So that's gonna be the key foundation for it. Uh, and then you'll also see a lot of work from us around how do we help our customers build cost-effective, highly reliable, scalable infrastructure to support these next generation AI workloads. Yeah, I think that ties back to what we were talking about um, in the first question is there is network complexity. It's harder to observe traffic. You know, you can't just get away with doing a packet capture on everything that turns into a network. It's too much, too much traffic. It's too encrypted, it's too many layers. So what you need is you need to be able to bring up solution or mechanism to collect the data, process it so that it's ingestible by a human again. And the answer to that is right now is AI, obviously. And then there's 
there? There's also another conversation about the infrastructure for AI. So there's AI and how that's leveraged in ops. There's also the conversation of how do we build infrastructure to support all of this new AI infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and, and we think that that's a really exciting opportunity for us. There are a lot of things on the horizon in Juniper around very, very high speed switching platforms. And we do think that that industry, which is largely in Finiband today, is shifting towards Ethernet. And, and, and we see a lot of evidence and data around that. And so um, you know, we've been a leading Ethernet switching provider for more than a decade and, and we'll continue down that path. And, and yes, yeah, so we're very excited about that opportunity too. Well, that's exciting. And I think that's a great note to end on. I want to thank our panel again for joining us today. And we encourage you to drop your own questions into the comments and we will answer them as soon as we can. To learn more, click on the links in the description and follow us on Twitter. See you next time.